Hey everyone, it's Mr. Bennett. Welcome to my dining room. Um, we are going to look at DNA today and we're going to dive a little bit deeper into how DNA is packaged and how different types of cells, eukaryotes versus prokaryotes, um, package their hereditary information. And the first thing you need to remember is that DNA or nucleic acids of some kind, whether it's deoxyribose nucleic acid, what we have, or ribonucleic acid, which is what things like bacteria have, RNA, is the hereditary information for the cell. Um, and the complexity of the organism does play into the genetic code a little bit. For instance, we are very complex organisms. Um, our hereditary information is stored in about three billion base pairs. So if you picture DNA as a big long ladder, three billion rungs on that ladder, um, which codes for about 10,000 genes. Um, and so we're gonna get to kind of where that information is packaged and how it's stored. But something like bacteria, E. coli, is kind of the classic example. E. coli has three to four million base pairs, so less than a tenth of our uh, genetic code. And it's only got a few thousand genes. It's a relatively simple organism. It's very, very small, single-celled, asexual, uh, and it actually uses RNA. It doesn't even have DNA. Well, that's not true. It's got a chromosomal DNA. Um, so it's, it's, it's very simplistic in nature. And so we're going to be looking at the differences between a eukaryotic system, something with a nuclear envelope, uh, something with membrane-bound organelles like our cells, animal plant cells, uh, versus something like bacteria, which don't have those organelles. They do not have any membrane-bound organelles to hang on to uh, different structures that carry out cell processes. Um, there are regions of information on DNA, and so we're talking about eukaryotes right now, and there are regions of what we call exons and introns. An exon is a region of uh, a DNA of a chromosome that codes for some kind of gene. Now, this exon can be very, very long. It can be very, very short. Uh, it depends on what, what, what region of the DNA it's in and what that particular gene does. And even regions of exons can be excited, they can be turned on, or they can be turned off as that gene is either expressed or repressed by our body systems. And that's something we're going to get into in a few videos. Introns, on the other hand, are just spaces in between the genes, they or in between the parts of the gene. So imagine um, a text in a book, and there is a sentence that you can read, and then there's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo gibberish in between. And then you've got another portion of the sentence or the paragraph, and then some gibberish in between. These introns, they are space fillers. And we're this, the, the, the purpose of the introns is kind of beyond the scope of the video, but it's something we're going to come back to when we get into class, and we might come back to it in a later video. But the big thing that you need to understand is that this chromosome, right, this little, this, this, this length of DNA within the cell is very complex, even in its own internal structure. So exons are, uh, they, they hold portions of a gene and there are some mechanisms and systems in place for that, for our, for our body to produce a protein from that gene where we splice out introns and we'll get to that when we look at transcription and translation. So exons hold the genetic information, the, the gene encoding portion and the introns are the other parts in between those genetic code portions of the DNA. When we're talking about storing our DNA, this is where we can get very, very complex, and we're gonna split between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. So let's start with eukaryotic cells. We are looking inside of the nucleus. So all eukaryote cells have a membrane-bound nucleus, which means that there is a membrane around our genetic information. And inside the nucleus is the genetic code, the DNA for that cell. The DNA never leaves the nucleus. It's, it's held in there for a very, very specific reason, and it's to maintain the integrity of the genetic code. There is a molecule that passes through the nuclear envelope into the cytoplasm, and I bet you know what it is, but we're gonna to come to that in another, again, a video or two. We're looking ahead a little bit. So we're gonna zoom in on the nucleus, and we've got these things called chromosomes. And what we've got drawn here on the page is a duplicated chromosome, and we'll see this when we get into mitosis and meiosis. And this duplicated chromosome, and if we zoom in even more, is really a coiled up strand of DNA and we call that a chromatin fiber, that individual strand. And if we look very, very closely on that fiber, we see that DNA is kind of spiraled around these large proteins. And these proteins are called histones. And it's not a single protein. It's actually a complex or a structure of eight histone protein subunits. And the DNA wraps 146 base pairs. It's a very specific size. 146 base pairs around that histone in a spiral. 
And so if you take, think, um, take a string like a shoelace, right? And you twist and you twist and you twist and you keep twisting and twisting and twisting and that string starts to get shorter and shorter because it compacts down. Histones make sure that that genetic information, that code is stored very, very carefully inside of that chromosome. When the cell needs to use it, when it's around that histone, it's deactivated. It's not accessible by proteins or enzymes to carry out replication or transcription. And so when we look in the next video and we talk about replication, there's a process of activating that genetic region. We have to unwind a portion of that string so we can get to our double helix to read the base pairs. So histones is a complex of eight histone molecules, 146 base pairs wrapped around in a spiral. And as we continue to unwind and unravel, we see that that classic double helix twist. Take a ladder and you spin it sideways. And the base pairs are linked in the middle. And the, the outside of your ladder is constructed from a phosphate ribose sugar, deoxyribose sugar in DNA, um, alternating as the sides and then our nitrogenous bases meet in the middle. So that's eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell storage of that DNA. In prokaryotic cells, there is no nucleus. There is no nuclear envelope to protect, to protect that genetic material. And so they have a different mechanism for, for storing their DNA. Now remember, this chromosome, it's a single loop-shaped chromosome. If we could stretch it out, it would be a complete ring. It's about four million base pairs, and it can have a, anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand genes, depending on the organism. So we're actually gonna go reverse on this one. So we're going to start off, we, we take our, our, our loop and it's very, very condensed. It looks like there's histones there, but they're not actually histones. And, and this is really interesting. We're not quite sure what the mechanism is for packaging. And so we can, we've got kind of a representation here. We call these super coiled loops. Um, and this is about a thousand times smaller than what the full opened up chromosome would look like. So if we unravel it just a little bit more, we see kind of, it looks almost like a flower. So there are looped domains of this bacterial chromosome and they're attached at the base by some unknown protein mechanism. We know it's a protein. We know it's something that the cell is doing to maintain the integrity of the genetic code, but we're not quite sure what it looks like. And you gotta remember, this is the chromosomal DNA of that bacteria. It's all the code for that, for that bacterium to carry out its cell processes, to carry out, to build enzymes, to build proteins. There is another type of DNA in bacteria, they're called plasmids, and these are very small loops. They're very small rings. They don't twist up like the chromosomal DNA. Um, and we'll look at a picture, we'll look at an electron micrograph of what these, what, what these are, but essentially plasmids, they're small and they self-replicate. And when we talk about cloning, when we clone uh, proteins or enzymes, or when we're producing something, we use bacteria and we can actually insert a code, we can insert a gene into this plasmid and the bacteria takes it up and it just produces it as if it were its own. So they're kind of little mini factories that we can use on the molecular level. So the chromosomal DNA is what we're talking about right now to coil it up and to package it. And if we were to undo those loop domains, that looped chromosomal DNA, we would have a large ring shaped, it's not a, per, you know, it's not a perfect ring, but it would form a complete circle, um, a full circular chromosome. And remember, this packs it down to about a thousand times smaller than that fully uh, extended chromosome would be. So much like our own DNA, it's very, very long, six meters per cell, crunched down into a very, very small space. So the, the proteins are, are looping those up into smaller domains and we continue to twist them down into super coils that is eventually stored as a free floating molecule inside the cytoplasm of the bacterial cell. Once we get into the DNA, remember all DNA and all RNA is built out of five bases, depending on what we're talking about. There are purines and there are pyrimidines. And you need to understand the overall structure. You should remember that adenine and guanine are the two purine nitrogenous bases. And these are rings that are two fused rings. You have a six carbon ring, or excuse me, you have a six uh, sided ring and a five, excuse me, sided ring fused together. And the structures are very similar. Um, the main difference is that our amine group, right, switches from the number one carbon in adenine to the number three carbon in guanine. Uh, we fill in some nitrogen to, we break a double bond, we throw a nitrogen in there, we uh, throw a double bonded oxygen, we get a ketone in here. So some of the functional groups change, but their structure is based on that six-sided ring fused to a five-sided ring. And this, these almost start to look like steroids, but remember steroids are four fused rings. So don't confuse the two. 
uh, this, these uh, nitrogenous bases are attached to the ribose of the DNA backbone. Um, and then there are pyrimidines, and there are three pyrimidines, and that might be a memory trick for you. Purines, there are two of them pyrimidines, right? Pyrimids can have three sides, so we've got three pyrimidine molecules. These are single rings that are all very similar in structure. Um, some minor differences again. Cytosine kind of stands out. We have an amine group. It's an NH2 on the top here with a ketone oxygen off of the 1, 2, 3 carbon. And then thymine and uracil. Remember, thymine is replaced by uracil when we're inside of RNA. And there, look at the structures. The major difference between them is that thymine has a methyl group on the ring. Uracil is missing a methyl group. And that's the only difference between the two. Your ketones are in the same places. Uh, we have a double bond. We just add a hydrogen instead to take up that place of the methyl group here. So those are interchangeable depending on whether you're in DNA with thymine or if you're in a uracil uh, RNA. Um, and so it could, don't, don't forget your base pairings either, right? Adenine always pairs with the thymine. Guanine always pairs with the cytosine. And thymine and uracil switch spaces again when we're looking at our complementary strands. So the structure of DNA, the main thing to take away from this is that our cells package DNA differently. If you're in a eukaryotic cell, we've got chromosomes with histone complexes. If you're in a prokaryotic cell, you have a single ring-shaped chromosome that is super coiled with some kind of protein bond to form loops in there. In our next video, we're going to look more at replication. How do we unwind this DNA to create a, a, a copy to prepare for cell division? And then we're going to move into um, gene excitation or gene repression. Uh, and how do we deal with introns versus exons in that genetic code?